All right, guys, welcome to today's webinar. Everybody's unmuted. Ernest, how's it going? Going well, thank you. Thank goodness for our uh, TLT today, huh? That's for sure. <laughs> uh, Oscar, how's it going? You got your TLT in today, I hope? Yes, sir. All right. I'm in. Nice. At your allocation. Your silver positions as well? Silver positions also. Excellent. Uh, Karen, what's going on? You got your mic muted. And Rakesh, uh, welcome to the webinar as well. You got your, your mic muted if you guys want to unmute. Ron, how's it going? Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I can, Rocky. How's it going? Good, good. Maybe we should buy more of silver. Pull the chart of the spy here. So let's see, I'm, what did I, I think we did at 288. Uh, so yeah, so basically uh, one of my favorite uh, person, uh, banks to follow for trying to do technical analysis, really it's more uh, flow analysis. And uh, he's, he's relatively accurate. Uh, last year he was pretty, pretty good at predicting little volatility quakes relative to the quantitative tightening. Uh, but after he got a lot of publicity for that, the Fed came in there and started to uh, to patch up those little uh, opportunities he was finding. Uh, but his analysis is that if we close below 290 today, that all, a lot of these uh, these funds that are rotating between stocks and bonds are going to go 100% uh, short on the stocks. Now this only goes to a certain level, and they all flip right back to long. Um, so that's why today's trade alert was a little different than normal. Let me just pull it up so we can go over it and we'll see how much it's changed. Um, I'll pull up the screenshot actually from the trade alert. Is everybody uh, able to do today's new trade alert with uh, no problem? Yeah, no problem. Okay, so so yeah, so the I mean, I did the uh, I was telling this uh, the spy three hundred, and that has not uh, been bought yet. Yeah, yeah. Now I'd expect uh, if we get a say, a lot of the times these you know there's this there's this plunge protection team. It's, it's these big banks, uh, and they really. You know, they can't sell all their stocks if they wanted to. The best they can do is hedge losses with the options market and maybe let go of a little bit. Uh, so in general, the whole financial system is not engineered for stock crashes. No, none of the big banks want that. Maybe some of the smaller hedge funds uh, managing, you know, between a billion and maybe up to a hundred billion dollars could be in the uh, predicament where they want to short the market. But uh, when you look at your big black rocks and all those guys with trillions in assets, all the big central banks around the world, you know, none of them can ever sell their positions, uh, at least not in totality. So there's, there's a lot of reasons why the market wants to push it up higher. Uh, but these short term guys are going to sell. If we don't close today at 290, there's a high probability that they will be selling very strong uh, tomorrow and Friday. Uh, now, my expectations is they're going to let all the weekend sell it all out today. And that's why we're a little late on the alert. I was trying to give us as much time as possible for uh, the prices to get as low as possible so that when we sold that put, we get the maximum profit and the cheapest setup. Uh, so it's gone a little bit lower than when, when we did this trade uh, by about 90 cents, but I'd expect they come in with a huge buy order at the very end of the day and try to get it above 290. So we'll see if, if I'm right, uh, here's kind of the look. Now the idea is we have a little bit extra duration on our long call, uh, but we realize there's a high risk here. So I didn't wanna be uh, taking on a huge amount of risk like we did Monday in this position. So if I had just been $2 tighter on that put on Monday, uh, our return today would be, uh, instead of 0.4% for the month, uh, it'd probably be more like 0.6. So we would have had 
even better profit. But of course, I was uh, not expecting this at all. And so our maximum risk going into this trade is $1.97 per share. And here's what's really important to keep in mind when we look at the risk we're taking in the, in the SPY, we've got to ask, ask ourselves if we get another scare in stocks in the next 48 hours, which uh, is possible for sure, uh, do we have protection in the other piece of our, of our uh, portfolio, which is the TLT? And so we sold the 148. All right, Murray's in. Murray, did you get the uh, trade alert after all? Murray, your mic's muted if you want to unmute. So we're taking- calls. Yeah, I, I, I was afraid you forgot to make it today. Yeah. Did you get it? Yes. Oh, good, yeah. So if you're listening, I was waiting till the last second to issue the trade alert uh, because I, I was hoping to get the bottom of the crash in the SPY, so we get the max profit on that SPY and the best setup uh, for the rest of the day. So I, I waited till the last second to uh, to pull the trigger on it. Um, so what, yeah, so let me just go back so Murray knows what we're talking about here. So here's the, the calculus here. So I'm saying, all right, I have ha approximately 40% allocation in the SPY and I have 40% allocation in the TLT. So I wanna make sure that the risk I'm taking between now and Friday and the SPY is covered, if I'm wrong, by my TLT position. And so we got to remember what call option did we sell on the TLT? Well, it was that 148. So we actually could take significantly more risk than this trade and still be fine uh, if we go back to the chart. So. Uh, TLT has completely offset the loss we had uh, from Monday's trade alert, and then we picked up the profit on the gold and silver. Uh, but we still have a huge amount of room for the TLT to go up higher and continue to protect our portfolio. Now, are we guaranteed that if the SPY goes down a dollar, the TLT will go up 50 cents? Not necessarily, uh, but uh, that has been the trend. And I think the TLT is going to continue to be uh, the single best safe haven asset when there's signs of trouble uh, until it gets a little bit lower on the rates. We'll look at those rates and how low we think they might go on the 30 year. Um, so, so we have plenty of protection with the TLT position to take on the risk that we put on with this new trade on the SPY. And so Murray, I was, I was telling everybody, there's a, a bank I like to follow, Nomura. It's the biggest bank in Japan. Uh, probably one of the biggest players in the equities market worldwide. Um, and their central bank doesn't just buy bonds, they also buy stocks. So they're probably, probably one of the single biggest purchasers of U.S. equities. Uh, regardless, though, we have a maximum risk of $2. And as you can see, um, this actually has the wrong... This is the correct trade here. I apologize, guys. This risk graph uh, actually undercalculates our potential profit uh, because it's supposed to be the October 7th on that final call option. Did everybody do the October 7th on their long call? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. So I apologize on that error on my end. So the idea is that if we do get a pop above 290, which I think um, there's a lot of probabilities that that will happen, because if it doesn't, we're gonna see a lot more downside ahead, potentially next, next 48 hours. So come Friday, we want to have uh, some time premium left on that call option. So our call option can be in the money on Friday and have a lot of time premium. So we can get a very large payout uh, if I'm correct and we get a rally in stocks. Now, if I'm incorrect, our maximum loss uh, is so look at the difference. So uh, this cost a dollar fifty eight, and uh, in the screenshot on this risk graph, it was a dollar nineteen. So that's an extra, only an extra forty cents of, of risk. So our maximum risk is really uh, two thirty five, and not a dollar ninety seven. So worst case scenario is we may lose two dollars a share 
$2.35 a share approximately on the SPY from here on Friday. Uh, and I would believe that that would be totally offset by returns in the TLT, gold, and silver. So I, I believe worst case scenario is that if I'm wrong, uh, we'll still generate a profit from the other pieces of our portfolio. Now, if I'm right, I just don't see a big sell-off in TLT, GDX, or SLV uh, because all of these risks are not disappearing. We now have a clear path to massive rate cuts over the next uh, 12 months. And the next thing that happens most likely is the U.S. trade war uh, potentially breaks down. So, so our total allocation here is relatively safe. Now, if we do get a pop in equities, uh, because I still don't think we have a stock crash on our hands, we'll, we'll look at what would make me think we have a long-term bear market ahead. But if we are correct and we get a good pop, uh, we can generate anywhere from two to maybe up to five dollars a share on the SPY from that long call we're purchasing. So it's a really nice setup for us. And what's beautiful is is when we, you know, is we of course we'd rather make money on every trade in every part of our portfolio uh, every day. Let me see. We got. Oh, okay, I see some chats. Uh, Ron's flying out of the country. Karen says good, has noise in the background. Ron hopes markets hold up. Okay, great. Um, okay, so let me pull up my chart. So we had sold the 293 right here. Uh, and so this big, the reason the SPY is so lucrative and so valuable to, to own uh, and has such high returns throughout history and such high premium in the call option market is because it has a great deal of risk in its asset. So it's a much riskier thing to own than something like the TLT. Um, and because of that, uh, when we can own a put and then have the asset drop significantly below our put, that means we were able to sidestep that risk and not have it impact our portfolio to such a degree. So I look at this as really quite a gift from the SPY for us to have a nice period of profits ahead, uh, as I don't think we have a long-term bear market at this point. Now we got the impeachment fears, you know, you turn on CNN, they're absolutely hysterical. Uh, uh, you go to Fox, you know, they're totally, for the most part, ignoring it. You go to CNBC, uh, you know, they're, they're really more concerned about WeWork uh, and all these different IPOs failing. Um, and, and, you know, of course, trying to cheerlead everybody in to buy the dip. Uh, but beyond that, I think the only th there's only really two things that would really frighten me for a long-term bear market. So uh, number one would be if we actually saw uh, our top companies having bad earnings. That's not the case yet. Uh, Microsoft had a record profit. Nike just had a record profit. Uh, really not seeing a decline in profits. So I'm not afraid from that. The ADP report today was a little bit less than they expected, but hey, it's still growing. 130,000 jobs. We've got a jobs report coming out Friday that'll most likely be strong. Uh, so overall, the, the data in, in the states for me is strong. Okay, that's one. Two, let's look at this chart going back further. So <clears throat> another thing that would scare me was would be if the long-term 30-year treasury became too attractive in terms of its yield to scare money out of stocks. And so if you listen to Jeffrey Gunlack, he says it's not the inverted yield curve that should worry you. Because right after that happens, typically uh, the Fed will react by lowering rates and printing money. So actually right after an inverted yield curve, you can get a, a pretty significant boom in stocks. It's after that when the rates on the bonds start to spike and the yield curve sharpens, that money looks at an opportunity 
Now let me pull up this, uh, our current rates here. Okay, so right now, you know, we know the U.S. is trying to target a 2% inflation rate. So buying a 30-year uh, treasury, at best, you're trying to break even right now, or you think that inflation will be less than 2%. Uh, if we go back to the last crash in 2018, this was a lot different picture, and these rates were actually significantly higher. So all of a sudden, you have... Uh, you have a Fed raising rates back in uh, the last quarter of 2018. You've got quantitative tightening, pulling money out of the system, and then you're getting very high yields on the 10-year. I think it got up to 3%. And so then you got to ask yourself, do I want to have almost a risk-free trade where I make 1% a year after inflation on the 10-year treasury, or I want to gamble on stocks ahead of a tightening monetary policy? And so that's what caused our last crash uh, in Q4 of 2018. This year, it's a different picture. The clear path for the bond market is lower rates. So where else are you going to invest your capital? And I would argue it's going to be in U.S. equity. So my major prediction right now is that uh, these banks have built tremendous, tremendous amounts of uh, allocation to the bond market, not just treasuries, but also uh, uh, junk bonds. Just they, they're taking these bonds of all the corporations, turning them into a new security that lumps them all together, a lot like they did in the 08 crisis when they did the bad loans. The banks were giving out loans to people who didn't deserve them, uh, had no income. They're buying, you know, half a million dollar houses and they're making 3,000 bucks a month. Well, the picture this time is, is now the same thing, but in the bond market with corporate debt and sovereign debt. And so there's just no way they can sell these bonds for a profit. A lot of it's negative yielding. So if they do hold it to the end, it's a guaranteed loss. No way around that. And so they're trapped. They know they can't get out of these bond positions without uh, causing a mass exodus. And so I believe what's happening right now is they're patiently waiting for the central banks to come in and bail them out. So they buy these bonds back from the banks for a big profit. Their, pro uh, their balance sheets will now be wide open to support uh, the equities market. So that's what I think is going to start happening here. And we're seeing it already. I'm not just predicting that this will happen. Uh, it is happening. And just today, for example, the New York Fed purchased $2 billion of treasuries. Now, they can't buy it straight from the, uh, from the auctions. They have to do it from the dealers. So isn't that handy for the, for the banks? So that's, that's what I believe will happen is we'll see these rates drop lower, kind of just following the German yields. I think there'll be a spread between the German yield and the US yield. And that would be our best indicator for just how low uh, our Fed is willing to allow the rates to go. But it can't go too low. Otherwise, the banks and the pension funds get dramatically hurt. So let's look. Uh, and here's your German bonds all in negative territory. So they can go much lower than they are now. Um, I would guess probably around 50 to 100 basis points before uh, they try to peg it there and just do massive QE. So that's what I'm expecting is probably another 50 to 100 basis points in rate cuts in the next 12 months and the resuming of QE. Now, everybody's saying they're gonna to try to word it a million different ways. In fact, they're already doing it and not even talking about it. Uh, so that's, that's really what I'm expecting. Now, what could derail the stocks? We look at a few charts. The biggest supporter of stocks are the central banks and the corporations. And you gotta realize these guys have an indefinite lifespan. They don't have to worry about uh, you know, a one year correction like we've had in 08 or 2000 uh, because corporations never die and these central banks never die. So they really aren't super concerned uh, about equities right now having some sort of pullback. Um, let me go to the chart. So 
if we have relatively free credit corporations, which this is the LQD ETF, companies like Microsoft can actually go to foreign uh, countries and get debt at a negative rate, and they are. And so that, that means they're getting paid to borrow money to go buy back their own stock. So it's gonna be hard to have a serious long-term sell-off in equities uh, when credit is cheap. So that's one good indicator. Uh, what about below the top, top companies? Well, we look at HYG, and again, it looks healthy as well. So companies have access to credit. They can buy back their own, uh, their own stocks, and they're doing it at record pace. So that's positive for us. The earnings are still strong, so that's positive. The job growth is still strong, and the rates are still headed lower. So what would derail this? I would argue... Uh, most likely, the only thing would be a major escalation in the trade war. And unfortunately, that seems to be what's headed our way. Uh, now, can we get a period of peace? I've done some studying of the Cold War, uh, which lasted a very long time. And there's periods of peace and there's periods of escalations. And you think it's time to just jump on the, the bear bandwagon right now, uh, but actually, if you go back and look at the beginning of the Cold War, uh, it actually was very bullish on equities as these two countries would print money, support their markets. And that's what I suspect will happen aggressively in the next 12 months. So I still remain uh, constructive on our long spy position, despite obviously being wrong uh, in the short term currently. Uh, but because of our general strategy, obviously, we're still making a nice return. In fact, I was very happy to see we we're already at a 0.4% return in the first two days of October. So it's, it's working out well. Uh, but boy, that, if you're not following the bond portfolio, uh, now's the time to make sure you arm. Uh, most likely, if I'm correct, we'll see bonds kind of just stay where they're at for the next few weeks and a major rally in equities in October and November uh, trying to get ahead of uh, lowering rates and QE. Now that that big catch is if we get uh, if we get some major negative data in the U.S. economy, that could derail that plan. And of course, the bonds will pay off again, uh, or the trade talks break down. But they're not even scheduled to till uh, October 11th. So I believe there's going to be a period of hope at least. Okay, Rocky says, is it a good time to buy TLT and GDX? Yeah, Rocky, the, the, the strategy is not uh, a timing strategy. It's, it's a total allocation strategy. So uh, the best bet is to follow the strategy at all times and not try to, uh, even, even myself, you know, I, I do my best to predict these markets. I was wrong, but because of the strategy, we're up. And now I don't think I'll be wrong in the long run, but in the short term, certainly. I was telling everybody we're gonna break above 300. Uh, we were buying, uh, we were positioned for very bullish setup on the SPY. And what do we have? We have CNN going hysterical about impeachment inquiry. Uh, and we've got, I thought the Chinese would buy farming goods. They did, but I didn't anticipate the U.S. would not reciprocate in any way, shape, or form. In fact, the nicest thing the U.S. has done uh, was remove a few tariffs that were related to food. They really haven't done anything to the core demands of China, uh, which would be to delay the December tariffs and to uh, obviously let Huawei continue to do business and buy all these chips from uh, companies like Qualcomm. Without Qualcomm and without uh, the Android platform, their biggest phone company is likely going to go bust uh, within the next, three, you know, or at least have a serious downturn. And that's a huge part of their, uh, one of their top companies uh, for China. Let's see. I think we got a few more people. Let me find my... Oh, same crew. So that's that's pretty much where we're at, guys. I think we're going to see some massive money printing. I think we may have a period. I'm hoping we have a period of peace so our spy portfolio can pay off for us. 
Uh, but if not, you know, those precious metals and bonds are going to go up. Uh, so this general strategy is very strong. And um, until we see the credit markets crack, I just don't see a major sell-off that lasts in equities uh, because the bank can get nearly free credit and just buy the debt. And we also have central banks doing this and corporations doing this. Uh, so all in all, let's see. Oh, Murray's. Uh, any questions out there for me? I have a good uh, article I was going to share with you guys uh, that I wanted to I'll post it in the chat so you can click it and save it. I actually haven't got through all of it yet. Let me post it here. We'll preview it though. Yeah, Jason, I have a question when you're done with that. Oh, please go ahead. Um, I, I checked with my futures broker and and uh, I was making sure that we could trade C and H when the time comes. Okay. Um, they don't. They don't have anything with the symbol C and H. And uh, so I was wondering, is there another name for it, or? or... Let me log into my account, and um, I'll show you the how to get to it from Interactive Brokers. Okay. This is just to test it. I just set this account up just to play with it because our boot camp is going to specialize in uh, teaching people interactive brokers. But did you guys see Schwab came out with $0 fees yesterday? Uh, Murray's got Schwab. I bet that made you happy. It always helps. Yeah, it doesn't hurt, huh? Also, TD Ameritrade has also come out. Yeah, yeah, they had to. Their stock was crashing. Right. Okay, so you go to CNH in the search bar, scroll down. Now, I would love to do the, uh, the futures options because it's such a better way to speculate, but it's on the Hong Kong exchange. And unfortunately, they don't let you, uh, Americans can't do that. So unless you had some sort of citizenship, probably in Singapore or Hong Kong, or a company maybe formed out there, it'd, it'd be hard to do that. I'm gonna select the futures product. We're going to do the front month trade, sell, probably just the market order would be fine. So every contract represents a hundred thousand us dollars. And we've already had 25%. Uh, the way this is headed guys, I think they may devalue this significantly. Uh, so the actual buy and sell orders for this will be uh, part of the boot camp program, not part of the normal advisory. Um, but yeah, that's the setup we're looking at. So this would essentially say we want to sell um, the currency at today's rate and then buy it in the future. And we're speculating uh, that the cost to purchase CNH would uh, would go down. Now, in terms of how to find the access to this in your broker, I'll show you this. Um, so in terms of the financial information you're going to need to have to qualify, I think it's a hundred thousand dollar income per year. That's what they're looking for. I'll go look up the exact, they tell you what to put before you fill it out to ensure you get filled, but you need the Hong Kong exchange in the futures market. So make sure you have that. Uh, now notice in the futures options market, they don't have Hong Kong. Uh, so they're, the SEC is just not allowing us to play the options futures in Hong Kong, which sucks. Uh, but but that, that's a oh well. For our, for our group, we're not trying to be too speculative. So uh, owning, owning just a simple futures contract is fine. Now let me pull up a chart of that. Kyle Bass had a comment on this picture. Does this make anyone else feel uneasy? Of course, he's referring to a very similar photo of Hitler driving around in his car uh, exactly like that. I'll try to 
find the photo for the next next time. But yeah, I think what's important for us to to look back on, and if anybody wants to uh, to study some history to kind of get you prepared for what may be ahead, go back to the Cold War. Look at all the documentaries. It happens much slower than uh, than you would anticipate. So trying to predict we're going to have these conflicts faster than reality would probably be the biggest mistake for someone who's at least understanding what's coming ahead. Most people have no clue uh, what what's ahead of our, you know, the next decade. Now, Ray Dalio had an interesting piece about what he believes will happen. Now, you got to realize he has a conflict of interest. I really appreciate all the information he puts out there. Probably one of the most proliferate writers. Uh, he has a huge 800 page book that goes through uh, market cycles in something like the last 500 years, which I have not read in its entirety for sure, but I have uh, read a lot of his summaries of it and I do want to read that full book when I get the chance. He has a new post out uh, right here that I'll pull up, which we can look at today together for, for a little while. Um, but he, he mentions that they try, to, they try to make the change in the currency exchange rate a little difficult for people to just short. Uh, and you can see that, you know, they devalue it and then pull it back and devalue it and pull it back. And so I've been talking about doing this exact trade since we were in this area. And it's already moved almost up to the high uh, that we just saw in August. So at this point, I don't want to pull the trigger on that buy alert for the, or that, well, the sell alert for that futures contract until we get, we need a catalyst. We need a real catalyst. And we've had a mini, the mini catalyst was that the Chinese bought farming goods and the US did not reciprocate at all. And so speculators are already jumping on this and uh, obviously pushing that exchange rate right now. But if we do get some sort of interim deal uh, that could go against us really quickly. So I, I want to make sure we have a cat. We're probably going to miss a lot of the move by waiting for the catalyst. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, we're not going to risk uh, a significant sell off. Now, how much could it really sell off? Probably not a lot. I mean, if we went back to that 6.8 level, I'd be very surprised. So if we entered the trade right now, we probably have a risk reward ratio of around 4% in both directions. But if we wait and get a escalation, then I would say we have almost a 90% probability of a profitable trade. And uh, depending on what the escalation is exactly, it could go significantly higher. Now, another interesting thing is that, let me pull up this. I had become skeptical that, let's see what our spy's doing while we're sitting here. Oh uh, yeah, she's still sitting right there. So yeah, I would seriously, uh, if you want some fun, uh, watch the market in the last 15 minutes today. I wouldn't be surprised if you see a tremendous uptick. And that's what they like to do. They like to gap the prices and not have to fill it throughout the day. Uh, and so that makes it, you know, if they use the futures market and they use the very last five minutes, they can use a lot less money and uh, dramatically change the price. Now, if they were to go do it right now, they might be forced, uh, they might be fighting against a lot of selling all, you know, the entire rest of the day. So I definitely keep an eye on that. Uh, but I was skeptical that we, we had an okay profit, huh, Murray, on uh, put options on this. I don't know who else followed this one. We, we got half of them out for a profit, half of them expired worthless. And I realized that the Chinese are desperate to get capital. That's how they've been having such strong GDP growth. They've been increasing their debt levels by about 50% a year. US is uh, increasing the debt levels by around two to 3% a year. So they're increasing their debt at a rate of about 200 times faster than or rather 20 times faster than the US. And that's just absolutely insane. There's no way you can increase your debt by 50% a year uh, for 10 years. And the only way that continues for 
at least a little bit longer is if they get a trade resolution and a ton of money from around the world uh, buys into China. But for them to be able to raise capital, no one's going to raise capital if they think their stock market's crashing and their bond market's crashing. So my expectation is the Chinese will be more than happy to print money, uh, convert that CNH into dollars, and then flow it into the, the U.S. stock market where this, this asset lives. And so if they want to protect FXI and other index products like that, they're going to have to be uh, in every clever way possible, figuring out how to get money into the U.S. stock market to buy their own ETF uh, and index products. So if that's the case, uh, they're probably going to let the currency devalue before they would let the capital markets crash. So that's why uh, I had this epiphany that, hey, the way to profit, and this is Kyle Bass. Kyle Bass is a little different. If you study Kyle Bass, billionaire investor, I like to listen to him. He's trying to short Hong Kong. So he has a lot of interviews out there. If you just do Kyle Bass, uh, Bloomberg, Kyle Bass, Real Vision into YouTube, some great interviews. Uh, basically, he's saying China has grown at a much rapid rate relative to Hong Kong. And uh, there's a huge shortage of capital in Hong Kong. So he's actually expecting the Hong Kong peg to break, which hasn't even moved a blip so far. So we may actually look at some future contracts on that as well beyond CNH, but clearly the big money maker so far has been CNH. And so I, I believe they're going to have to sell their currency, which is only 1% of the, uh, the global currency market. So currencies are trading some $4 trillion a day. A very tiny part of that is the Chinese currency. And that's because they don't want their closed system to let all the money flow out. If they did allow everyone to do whatever they wanted with their Chinese currency, money would flood out at a rapid pace. Uh, so they're carefully controlling this exchange rate and, uh, and they're trying to also offset tariffs with it. So this play uh, has two main ways to pay off. Number one, if they need capital to support their stock and bond markets, they're gonna have to get dollars. And this may be one way they, they do that. They sell their local currency for dollars, flow that into US uh, stock market. Uh, the other <coughs> catalyst for this is just an increase in tariffs. So if the US does not make that threat of, de now they're saying the threat of delisting the Chinese was rumored Hello. by Bloomberg and not by the Treasury. So What's that's going on with with all your stuff. Uh, so, so we got two big pressure points pushing this currency to a lower exchange rate and why I really like that. So, so hopefully you get yeah. that figured out, Ernest. Um, okay, okay. Go ahead. But yeah, that's how to get it. Which uh, broker are you at? Ernest? Are, are, are you asking me? Yeah, which broker dealer are you at? Uh, well, I have two. They are uh, Tasty Trade and E Trade. Oh, okay. Um, so Tasty Trade's part of Ameritrade, right? No, no. Uh, Tasty Trade's on their own. Oh, really? Okay. It, it's... Well, I know Interactive Brokers has it, and so. Um, each contract is relative, you know, maybe call them up and say, hey, I'm looking to trade uh, the Chinese currency in the futures market on Hong Kong exchange. And that in interactive brokers, um, and here I'll show you another way to find it, cnmegroup.com. Markets, Forex. There it is right here. Uh, they may call it RMB as a different ticker. The RMB? Hmm. So it's not a super liquid market. You can see the volume. 
I mean, from our point of view, I mean, that's, that's an incredible amount of capital. Uh, my, my recommendation is going to be one contract per hundred thousand dollars in your portfolio for a target return of around uh, four to eight percent. So uh, that's a realistic short term profit I can see us generating from that trailer in a short period of time with the right catalyst. Now we're probably going to miss some of the move. <coughs> I'm seeing these exchange rates are reacting extremely quickly. Now, on the other hand, if the U.S. does want to delist uh, the Chinese securities, that would be incredibly devastating to equities markets, to the banks. The banks have hundreds of billions of dollars they've flo uh, flowed into China, and there's no way to get it out. It's a, it's, a, it's a trap. And so if this major decoupling really did happen, then most likely they'd have to give everybody a warning and look out below. I mean, that's when we'd want to buy the put options on FXI. So put options on FXI, I would have in our normal advisory, uh, but trying to do these more advanced futures trades will, will primarily be, uh, the buy and sells will be supported in the boot camp. But yeah, here's the futures contract. I'll post that here so you guys can try to find it in your accounts. Uh, so let me pull up this Ray Dalio article. So Ray Dalio apparently was very early to see the opportunity in China, watch their growth. Uh, you know, he's been out parading and cheerleading for China for the last few months. He's got, from what I understand, at least 20 billion of his $124 billion fund is from China, maybe more. And so, of course, he's going to say positive things about it. But he's got some good points, and he just points out at the current rate of GDP growth of around six percent for China. Uh, you know, even if you said that was inaccurate, say it's even three or four percent, uh, and then you compare that to the GDP growth of the U.S., which has been around two percent. In the next ten to twenty years, they're on track to become uh, the highest GDP country in the world, no question. And so from his point of view and a lot of these recent interviews, he, he blatantly says, hey, I don't know who's going to win the trade war. But from my point of view, I want to have allocation to China just in case and has, you know, he has good presentations for that. This piece talks about what happens when two major powers become uh, in conflict with one another and when you have uh, two powers, uh, one power that's rising to challenge the bigger power, it almost always results in conflict. <clears throat> it ends in war, and then you have a period of peace because everyone's, whoever wins the war, uh, everyone else is scared to confront them again. And so uh, he compares this to the 1930s and believes we're headed towards a, a big depression where uh, the big picture view from his point of view is there's tremendous debt around the world. We're going to have to service this debt and work it down. And now there's this huge inequality gap. And, the, you know, just from my point of view, the income of most Americans has remained relatively flat and it has grown at a much slower pace relative to some of the big things we have to pay for in life, like, uh, like your housing, your health insurance, uh, and primarily those two, two items. And so you have this huge group of people who have not seen much of a pay increase, but their cost of living has gone up significantly. And so this is causing lots of populism around the world and conflict. And so, uh, so yeah, there is a lot of drama. He's also looking at business cycles. We're all kind of focused on 10-year cycles, at least I was, until I started to really study uh, Ray Dalio's information. Let me pull that up. Uh, so you can see, you know, if we look at this chart, okay, we got a crash in 2008, lasted a year, got a crash in uh, 2000, lasted two years. You know, the trend looks like crashes are lasting less and less time and uh, very misleading. If you go look at a bigger picture, uh, you'll find that, you know, there's these, sh these are just mini crashes. We, we look at these as big crashes. These are mini crashes in the big scheme of things. And so he's looking at 50 year wave cycles uh, on top of these 10 year cycles. And so he's saying not only are we at the end of the 10 year cycle, 
uh, we're actually getting to the end of a 50 year cycle. And that's where all this debt has to get paid down and all these people who are having a hard time uh, uh, getting by, uh, we're gonna have a transfer of wealth one way or another uh, through the governments. So if that's correct, then uh, we have a long-term bear market in equities, bonds aren't gonna do anything, the yields are gonna go up. So you're gonna have a double whammy, the SPY and the TLT both crash for a long period of time. And so he's, he likes gold at this point. Now I think you know, that's looking very far down the road. Uh, now he's only, his last prediction was a 40% chance of recession uh, just a month ago. And I think that chance is dramatically rising as uh, we don't see a trade war coming to any sort of resolution. So that's kind of the big picture threat. If we go back to his article, it's really long. So if you do go to the chat right here, I don't think you can see it, but there's a link to this. It's a good read. Uh, he's been publishing different variations of this for over a year, like this graphic I've seen many, many times. Uh, but it goes back, relates this to the Great Depression, the 1930s. Uh, and the big thing was Germany had created World War I. Everybody was pissed, you know, wanting reparations. Uh, and everybody got so greedy that they punished Germany so much that they began printing lots of money. They changed currencies. They did all sorts of crazy stuff. They ended up with hyperinflation. And because Germany went bankrupt, it took all of the surrounding uh, countries around it and eventually the U.S. And then what did we get? We got Hitler and World War II. Uh, so I think he's predicting something of that nature happening in the next decade uh, because of our circumstances. And um, if we do cripple China, clearly it will cripple the rest of the world. Uh, and I also study, there's a other resource I'll give you guys. Let me see if I can find it. I'm not completely sure who the hell these guys are. They're interesting. They're, they're certainly not uh, pro-Trump, which is, I, I like to get lots of point of views. I listen to CNN, Fox, CNBC, Bloomberg. You know, I listen to uh, Glenn Beck. I listen to as many points of view as I can, even if it drives me nuts. Um, <laughs> these, this is a very interesting interview you guys can listen to. I'm not quite sure. I need to look into exactly who they are. They do a lot of a lot of content, but they're doing a war game where they're trying to predict what might the Chinese do and the U.S. do in a trade war. And you know, the the summary was that they thought that China will not do the trade deal that the U.S. wants and that the US will quickly realize that. And then rather than try to actually get a trade deal, uh, the, the US will just simply try to slow down China as much as they can to stay in the lead. And so, uh, so that's, that, that's the way things are going right now. China believes they are just getting out of their 100 years of shame from their point of view, they've already stolen the golden goose. They've stolen so much technology that, you know, they can now develop their own technology. They've had all their kids in our best schools. Uh, so they've really planted the seed for prosperity in China. The problem they have is a huge amount of debt. So they're going to have to restructure that debt. If they get cut off of capital, uh, certainly they will have a period of depression, most likely in China. Uh, but that would send the entire world into a depression. Now, probably U.S. would be the last to feel that, uh, but that, quite frankly, looks like what may happen. Now, upshot, do the Chinese make some reforms? Does Trump want to do a deal just to get reelected? You know, that's some of the handicaps that make it hard to predict uh, whether we can get a deal or not. Um, and even if we do get a deal, will they abide by the terms or does this just reescalate uh, in a few years? So Chinese have made tons of promises uh, and broken all of them. So 
quite frankly, it doesn't look too hopeful for a trade deal uh, in the long run. Now, in the short term, we got that election ahead of us. We got this crazy CNN uh, going hyperbolic on impeachment every other day. Uh, the government's in a gridlock, can't get an infrastructure project passed. So it's, it's, it's hard to predict. That's why our strategy is so powerful. Uh, now, the big fear, obviously, would be if TLT and the SPY were to crash at the same time. Uh, but I just don't see that happening right now. The Fed still has a lot of ammo. Uh, until they have lowered their rate to zero and begun some massive QE, I think they have plenty of ammunition to protect the credit market. And so from that point of view, I'm not worried about the TLT. So the TLT is really our secret sauce to be able to take that risk on the equities which hasn't paid off uh, as much as I'd like it to have paid off this year. As you can see, uh, we've made almost three times as much money from the TLT as we have from stocks, uh, at least in the SPY. Now our Tuesday trade has done a nice return and picked up a big gain uh, just in the last few days from silver, uh, but that's not even the same asset class as equities. So I still still believe we're, we're very early in this, in this war with China. It's gonna last a long time. And until, okay, Rocky says, what's the scenario the TLT crashes? With SPY. With the SPY. <clears throat> sure, let me... Um, I used to have these saved in my list. I'll pull up the... Okay, so probably, okay, so here's what Ray Dalio is talking about. You know, these are many, these are many crashes we had. Okay, he's looking at something like this, 1965 to 1982. Okay, that's right during the Cold War. It's also right during a period where um, we had done massive programs to try to support uh, from the, really from, from the 50s through the 60, 60s, we did massive government programs to help people. And uh, eventually that caused inflation. And then in front of inflation and lots of debt, we entered a Cold War. And you know, with those two combos, you get a long-term bear market, or what Ray Dalio would say is this. So if you look at this as like a, a wave, you got the little mini moves, but then you got the big wave. And so he's saying these little crashes are just tiny little specks compared to what's ahead. And so he's expecting something like this period right here, uh, or we don't have a lot of good data in the 30s, but something like that. Uh, let me go back to the big picture. One second, let me read fresh line. Uh, so we have the same setup. We've got massive subsidies in the US government, huge deficits, growing debt, and we're about to enter a 10 year plus Cold War with China. So the setup is just remarkably similar to that period of time. Now I'm surprised he doesn't compare it as much to this period. Um, I think maybe he likes the analogy of, you know, the, the pressure the world put on Germany to basically bankrupt them caused a global depression. And so if we put too much pressure on China, uh, yeah, maybe we get them to finally uh, behave correctly. And maybe that's what the world needs. Maybe that's what the U.S. needs to remain its dominance, but at the end of the day, it's still going to crash uh, markets. So the answer, Rocky, is if you get inflation and poor earnings at the same time, you get bond yields going up, the Fed has to raise interest rates when there's inflation, and then you get the stocks to crash at the same time. In fact, just the bond yields going up alone can crash the stock market. Uh, so what causes inflation? That's money printing typically does, but we've had a lot of money printing from 08 to current. 
and not have a lot of inflation. So the, the problem is they go lend all this money to the banks, the banks go lend the money to the corporations, the corporations then go buy back their own stocks. So they've completely circumvented uh, you know, 99% of the population by doing that. Uh, maybe 90%, I guess maybe 10% has a healthy stock portfolio. Uh, so it's a big joke. So they're gonna realize at some point, and we're seeing it, is this idea of money, uh, modern money theory, helicopter money, Basically, the, the central bank will circumvent buying the treasuries from banks and just start loaning money directly to the government and the government can uh, dish out the cash right to the people. So uh, this is quite frankly, almost in my mind, guaranteed to happen within the next 10 years. Maybe not in the next election if Trump's in there, uh, but you get somebody like Elizabeth Warren, they want to do that. They want to take the money, bypass the banks, and give it straight to the people. So you go start printing a tremendous amount of money, give it to the people. They're all going to rush to buy the same goods. You better bet those prices are going to skyrocket. Um, look at the uh, look at the college market. Um, Peter Schiff has a big piece about this. Now, I don't necessarily listen to Peter Schiff for trading ideas, but I love his commentary, and he points out. Uh, the cost of a college education uh, before the government started guaranteeing loans was extremely cheap. I think it was like three months of work could get you a uh, year of college education. And then uh, at some point, the government came in and said, hey, we will guarantee the banks money to loan citizens uh, student loans. So what do you know? Anybody and their mom can get a student loan. The prices of colleges have skyrocketed. Uh, so, so that's probably what's happening. We're probably going to figure out, all right, we print money, it goes to the banks, banks loan it to the corporations, corporations buy back their own stocks, and, uh, and you don't get any money to the people, you don't get any inflation, okay? So we're going to have this big populist movement that says that's just not fair, let's give the money to the people, well, that, at first, that's going to be really strong for the GDP. We're going to have these great GDP numbers, probably stock market rallies really strong. And then what's going to happen? Then you get inflation. Now, if the cost of goods starts going up too quickly, that's when the Fed raises rates. So let's look at uh, some history here. Let's see, what is this? Okay, here's your federal funds rate. So uh, here's how you get the, the crash that really hurts everybody, or at least if you're not prepared for it. You know, I, we are, we understand that the risk here, but okay, so look at here. 65 to 82, that's a long bear market. Now we had some rallies, but overall this is a big move to the down. Uh, we went from 73, 7,600 Dow down to 2,000. So what is that? That's like a maybe an 80% crash. A lot of loss. What happened to bonds during the same period? Okay, 65, we have a rate of three and a half. 82, what a coincidence, huh? 19%. Uh, it was a great time for savers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yep. So that's how you get the double crash. You get inflation and then you get a recession in earnings. And then boom, it's disastrous for, uh, for most investors. Now, as you've seen, Rocky, we know how to, to design the options to profit from down moves. Yep. Uh, but it's not quite clear when the top and bottom is in because you can see this huge gyration. Uh, so it'd be very easy to be confused during these, this period of time. 
so yeah, so I think we're going to zero. We're printing a ton of money. Probably going to switch from giving it to the banks to giving it to the people. Uh, probably not during, uh, if Trump wins in November, probably not during his administration. Um, although they're kind of doing that already, just with huge uh, government spending regardless. Uh, but maybe the next president after that will come in there and start uh, dramatically doing this modern money theory. We'll see. Uh, but regardless, uh, the same picture is playing out. And you can see that that big, you know, the, you can see the small cycle in this picture, these little bumps. And then you can see the big, the big cycle. And so the big cycle, all the all the top guys I follow, Ray Dalio, Jeffrey Gunlack, they're all predicting the same thing. And that's we're gonna have to work down these debts. We're gonna have to restructure uh, the way the money flows and that interest rates have to go up. So we may have uh, another few years of this madness and then a reverse of, of everything. Do you think they'll come out with a 50 year bond to try to extend all this and maybe not have such a hit? They said they are seriously considering it, so. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll see, you know, now the other side of the coin, uh, maybe, a lot of people can't explain why we're able to get away with such low inflation. I would say it's just because the money doesn't go to the people. It's just sticking in the stock, real estate, bond markets. It's not going anywhere. Um, but, you know, the other thing is, do we really have so much, you know, it's hard to really quantify what money is. It's, you know, it's this funny thing that we create by everybody going out and working. We've got new people being born every day. We've got technology making our populace more productive. Uh, so maybe, you know, we're just in a booming period and, uh, it, and that's why we can get away with such massive money creations because we're in such a big boom. So, you know, maybe that explains it. Uh, but I, I'd be skeptical of that view. And um, I'm afraid probably the exact opposite of what you're seeing in this chart is about to replay itself. Uh, and it's not going to be overnight, but you know, that's, what is that? That's 35 years from uh, the peak. So maybe we have at most five more years in this cycle, bottom out, massive money printing, same problems arise, inflation comes back. Let's go look at the inflation chart. So you can see we had the opposite problem in the 30s. Uh, Prices were dropping, nobody was buying anything. And then they start the money printing, lots of, lots of subsidies, and finally you get some massive inflation. And so they have to raise the rates. Now, <clears throat> come to modern times, we're in this low inflationary period. I mean, these are just beautiful prints. So the Fed at this point thinks they can print money with no consequence uh, and lower rates. And so, you know, is it, is it really this tech boom? You know, the Amazons, uh, the product, is the productivity just so overwhelming that we need more money to represent the, uh, the goods being produced? Uh, or, is, or is there just this loophole in the system uh, that's creating these low inflation numbers? And, um, and we've got some serious trouble ahead. So most of the folks that are a lot wiser than I am uh, believe that we have some serious trouble ahead. Uh, but I, I still try to keep an open mind. I'm, as you can see, we're still long the SPY, we're long the TLT, and uh, waiting, for, waiting for some of these problems to really arise. Uh, but at, at least we know, you know, a little one-year crash is not necessarily our biggest concern. Perhaps a 10 to 15-year bear market is, is more of a concern. And it could be as little as a couple years ahead that this all begins. Um, so just from guessing, I, I think we're several years away. But if we get a major decoupling with China, uh, that could really accelerate uh, 
the nightmare for, for investors who, who don't understand how to use the option markets to, uh, to do what we're doing. Uh. <laughs> so I'm curious of your opinion. I'm sorry. I, I was so busy before and I had so much noise back here. I probably missed a few things that you said and I'll have to review it later, but, um, your um, opinion of the fact that Visa and MasterCard has decided to back out on the uh, Libra situation, because I know how in favor you have been about that. Just curious what you're thinking. Oh, yeah. yeah. Facebook's under a lot of heat. Now we got Elizabeth Warren on his ass. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, well, I liked Facebook. Uh, from just a, a short-term play on the equities market because I was thinking the whole index would go up. Uh, but yeah, so we're entering a period where the central banks are going to be very irresponsible with money, most likely. And at the same time, Facebook wants to come out and solve the problem for you know, the entire world. So I can see why they've delayed that um, in the face of what's happening. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you know, that was kind of a dud for our portfolio. Um, so silver does the same thing as Libra, kind of, not really, but you know, it's the same idea. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, no, definitely. You see, did you listen to any of those little clips? Some, I guess someone snuck a recording of uh, Zuckerberg. Oh yeah. <laughs> pretty comical. Yeah. Well, you know, when they start eating their own, it's a, uh... It's interesting to watch. <laughs> yeah, I just don't know who's going to support Elizabeth if she really, I mean, it, it seems almost with certainty that will be the, um, the runner up for the Democrats. So, well, isn't it, isn't it interesting? You know, it's just typical politics. Pol the politicians say to the extremes, and then they wind up not doing that when they get in there versus what we've got now, which is Trump that said exactly what he was going to do and he's doing it because he's not a politician. So yeah, what is she, no, what true. is she really doing? Is she, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, nobody really knows these people. It's, it's garbage and it's really sad the state of what we have right now because you can't trust any of them because <laughs> it's politicians, you yeah. know. Well, she wants to do the, uh, the universal health care uh tax I, and i tend to believe her because she's been on these things for some time so i think she might be a little unique this way that she is saying exactly what she really believes i don't know i mean i believe, i believe her i think she'll be sabotaged uh by her own party yeah um i i believe her from 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 watching all the democratic debates i think she's you know she just seems kind of um Naive and uh, and honest, I guess is how I would describe her. And yeah, yeah, but at the same time, I mean, that would be a <laughs> she would be very frightening if she went in there. So, uh, just in my opinion, of course. Yeah, you have but, to have the support of, of one of the two, you know, powers to be. Uh, you know, on the Republican side is probably the, the hawks, the military, um, and then on the other side, you know, you got your healthcare and your um, mm -hmm. media and then you have the uh, the tech companies so Jason I just fell out of my chair did I hear you call the Indian princess honest <laughs> <laughs> okay well she's not honest about herself but her ideals maybe you know she keeps pushing those ideals and I mean she's been pushed on forever so but no she's not honest about herself let's let's clarify <laughs> But you know, well, I believe she uh, is going to try to push her policies that she's. Been oh yeah. Pushing. But look yep. at Bernie, man. He was going to win. He was easily going to win the uh, the last. He's going to take out Hillary, and they went and sabotaged him real quick. Oh yeah. Well, now he just had two stints put in his heart today, or something, or last yeah, night. Or so something. yeah, good luck <laughs> for Bernie. I mean, Bernie will sit there on the Democratic debate and shout at the. The commercials on this very show are corrupt. You know, like oh, Bernie. Um, Bernie never quite lost his Brooklyn accent, but you know, what can I tell you? <laughs> My New York what accent. If, what, if they somehow, you know, what if they can find enough legal loopholes to, you know, I don't think they have it, but if, if they did, they impeached Trump. Elizabeth Warren wins the election. Oh my God. 
<sighs> so I, I sometimes I wonder if let's see what the spy is doing now. Well, you know, and I was going to ask you. I don't care who, if any of them on the on on the Democratic side wins, because let's face it, they've been. You know, the brainwashing is very thorough here uh, throughout every media outlet possible and all their favorite little showbiz people. It's uh, just absurd. Y you know we have a problem when Nashville is, is, is gone liberal. <laughs> I mean, it just, oh, it's, gosh, it, yeah. Oh, and, ha and it has. And I can tell you because I have a presence up there and I just want to tear my hair out going, what is wrong with you people? But, um, you know, it, it's really uh, unnerving. And I think to myself, and listening to you and reading all this stuff, and I say, all right, if, if what you're saying is true, they're going to come after any of us who did, who did everything as hard as we could the right way, saving for, you know, and not leaning on the government for every doggone thing our entire lives, you know, so that we can have a good retirement. And everything does go turned upside down. I mean, I know the, the program does protect to a certain degree, but I'm starting to think, what's going to happen if she gets in? Is everyone all of a sudden going to go jump out of the U.S. dollar and go to Bitcoin or various other cryptos? Just because we don't know, you know, I mean, who, you, you know, when you're saying they're going to transfer this wealth over, this is very disturbing. And I, I, I need to have my head straight on what does that really mean? You know? Yeah, it's hard to predict. Um, well, we well, need look, to guys, we're getting people. a little bit of that rally uh, already, so we'll see. It could be a. I had watched the last five minutes for fun. I bet you you <laughs> see a huge uptick to close out the day. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to keep a close eye on old Elizabeth there. That's for sure. <laughs> Pocahontas. <laughs> I love it. Oh, you guys are God, it's gonna be brutal. I mean, I can just already see. Get the popcorn. <laughs> oh God, it's gonna be a treacherous uh, twelve months. I mean, they're already getting the. You can see CNN's already uh, trying to create as much drama as they can. Of course. Anyway, all right, guys. Well, any last questions? Uh, yeah, I just want to ask you, since you're looking for resources, would you like for me to send you a couple that I listen to from time to time, but frankly, I don't have enough time sometimes, and maybe you would like to? Sure, yeah, I'm always, uh, always open to, to new info. I, yeah, my uh, watch later uh, thing on the YouTube app never ends. So there's more info out there. Uh, Jeffrey Gunlock had a funny uh, webcast, I think, two, two, three months ago. He says uh, mm -hmm. he was making fun of China and they're so-called uh, STEM graduates. But he's calling it YouTube University. And it's just a tremendous amount of information you can get uh, in audio format, streaming constantly. Yeah, yeah, Rakesh, I'll, I'll put together of the uh, top sources I listen to. So I, I like to listen to quite a few people. Uh, By the way, uh, I'm just guys. looking at Zero Edge. It is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I like Zero Hedge. Yeah. I like Bloomberg. I mean, I'm mean, i just to sign everyone up. Everyone has a bias. As long as you understand what the news source's bias is. Right. Take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, that is always. Multiple points of view. And um, I, I only listen I really to BBC. I don't listen to any American TV. They're all <laughs> biased. <laughs> Hey, listen, I, I don't know about BBC anymore either. I'm going to tell you, I started, I was listening to them. I kind of pushed back a little bit on that too. You look at the Fox, you look at CNN, they're all biased. Oh, in yeah. Way. Sure they are. Yeah. So no, no point looking at them. Now, if you really want this a fair assessment, you go to look at somebody else in these. Certainly. All right, guys. Well, I really appreciate your time and we'll uh, keep a Close look on the spy for some fireworks to close out the day. And where should I, where should I send that in, that information? Uh, by the way, Jason, that uh, just to support is the only email I actually, okay uh, have over there. You got it. Cool. Thank well, you, Jason. Sure. Great job. All right, guys. Well, until tomorrow, we'll uh, we'll probably have the, a very similar setup on the TLT, nice and wide open uh, to protect our spy, and okay. um, and then yeah, no other changes. All right. Very good. Thank you. Take care. And when I did do today's trade. <laughs> okay.
<laughs> Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye.